So I am uh, I'm actually a, a interim scientific director for, o, uh, for OICR, uh, and I am director of informatics and biocomputing uh, here at o OICR, the, uh, uh, the informatics and biocomputing department. Um, and I'm also principal investigator for the Reactome knowledge base of biological pathways. Um, and it's in that role that I will be uh, I will be talking today, and we're going to be talking in more depth on how one can use uh, information on biological pathways and networks to improve our ability to understand uh, uh, and interpret uh, empirical uh, genomic data. So the main reason that people are interested in pathway and network analysis. Um, is is the statistics. Uh, the genomics is filled with rare events, cancer mutations, rare polymorphisms in the uh, uh, in the germline genome associated with diseases. Um, and typically we are always running ag up against uh, s relatively small numbers of patients or samples or variants versus very, very large numbers of, uh, of, of genes. Um, so when one does, for example, a microarray to, uh, ta uh, uh, against an experimental sample versus a control sample, you may see thousands of genes that have significant alterations in their expression. Um, and that becomes a, a, a statistical hypothesis testing problem. You have to apply multiple correction, and typically you could have a, a, a you you may not have sufficient power to distinguish the pattern you're seeing from random variation. So, pathway and network analysis, both this family of techniques, allows you to reduce thousands of genes to a smallish number of networks and pathways, typically in the in the tens. And that allows you to reduce multiple hypotheses, to find meaning, meaning in long tails of, uh, here it says cancer mutations, because this is a cancer institute, but any, it can be any rare event, you know, a rare copy number variation in the germline, for example, uh, and allows you to tell biological stories to identify, once you have a list of altered pathways in your hand, now you have, a, a, now you have an entry into testable hypotheses about the mechanics of the association between the disease and the variant or whatever you're looking at. It also allows you to do things like predicting the function of an unannotated genes um, and uh, to give you a framework in which you can do quantitative modeling of biological processes. So to be more specific, pathway network analysis is a very broad term. It's any analytic technique that allows you to make use of biological pathways or uh, molecular network information to gain insights into uh, an experimental system. Uh, it's very rapidly evolving with uh, hundreds of papers being published every year, many different approaches, um, and uh, um, a, a broad consensus on a few techniques and then a wide variety of other techniques which are uh, are uh, more uh, more experimental. So in the examples I'm going to give you uh, coming up, and in the and in the laboratory that Robin Hall is going to give uh, after after this lecture, um, we're going to use a data set from uh, 2013, which is the TCGA's um, uh, pan cancer analysis of 12 major cancer types. These were um, uh, uh, between two and three thousand patients who had a whole uh, who had uh, exome sequencing done, and in that in, in that day uh, in that set of cancer genomes, uh, 127 statistically significant cancer driver genes came up. It's a long list, and we're going to look at various ways of making this 127 uh, set of 127 genes make sense. Okay, so having introduced that. Um, we're going to step back, and now I'm going to talk about what the difference is between pathways uh, and uh, networks. And I would like to have a laser pointer. And do I have one? Where is it? 
Just in some, oh, there it is. Okay, good. Excellent. Okay. So what's the difference between a pathway and a network? Well, a pathway is uh, the biochemical um, the, the biochemical description of uh, a biological process, similar to what you learned in uh, high school and college in biochemistry, where there is a series of reactions with reactants going in and products coming out. The output of one reaction becomes the input to the next. Uh, and so here is a, uh, a depiction of the uh, EGF pathway, if I can get my laser pointer to work. Always screwing around with things when I shoot the area. All right, and we're showing the EGF. Uh, so in, in this depiction, each of the squares is a reaction, and there are uh, inputs to the reaction and outputs. So at the very top of this, we have the EGF ligand and the EGF receptor. There's a reaction in which they bind together to produce the e an EGF, EGFR uh, um, uh, dimer. Uh, this is inhibited by LRG1. Um, there's then, okay, oh, sorry, there's, so there's, a, sorry, there's an intermediate product in which EGF is bound to EGFR, and then another reaction in which uh, a dimer is produced, and this consumes a phosphate from ATP, and then there are further downstream reactions leading to uh, uh, EGF uh, uh, phos uh, 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 phosphorylated EGFR. Again, it's inhibited by SRC1. So we can continue. This is part of a much larger pathway. Um, this captures all the details of uh, stoichiometry and reaction, uh, and is the way we're used to uh, used to looking at these things. However, there's another simpler way of looking at it, which discards all the intermediate information, the detailed information that we don't really need to know about, like uh, uh, hydrolysis of ATP, and instead focuses on the core logic of the uh, of the the main reactants, EGR is uh, or EGF is stimulating EGFR, shown as an arrow here, and that is uh, that is stimulating the production of the phosphorylated product. It's inhibited by LRG1, uh, uh, and uh, you can add into this other uh, other. Product, other proteins that are known to uh, be involved, but we don't know exactly the role that they're playing. They're interacting in somehow, somehow, and this gives a simpler model, which in many ways is easier to um, compute over. But it also gives you less less detail about what's what's actually happening in the cell. So we're now going to talk now about where information on pathways and reactions come. So um, there are uh, pathway databases are, are formally called reaction network databases. The two main examples currently in the public uh, in the public database world are Reactome and Keg. They both use this biochemical nomenclature to describe biologic processes in, in great detail, uh, and uh, they represent uh, this this basic model. Um, is, uh, is focused on the reaction. There are inputs that go in, outputs that go out, and then there are regulatory steps that can inhibit or activate that, re that reaction, speed it up or slow it down. Uh, and this is a very, very gen generic model. It can be used to describe many things. It can be used to describe intermediary metabolism, where, for example, we have glucose going in and glucose 6-phosphate coming out first step of, of, uh, um, of glycolysis, or it can represent a uh, cleavage of the uh, pre-pro-insulin to, to form insulin. It can describe the transport of a protein or a small molecule from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, where the, one, the, the form that's inside the cell is the input, the form that's outside is the output. It can also be used to some extent, to describe react, um, interactions between cells. So it can be used, you can describe proteins, molecules, complexes, non-coding RNAs, all sorts of things 
can be can be fit into this can be fit into this model. Uh, uh, Keg, which is the oldest of the pathway databases still existing, is a very large and well curated collection of biological information compiled from published material. Um, because it's, it comes from published material, it means that there's a staff of curators who are taking all the knowledge from the papers and, put, and turning them into uh, a, a, a data model from which they derive diagrams. It's a curated database. Uh, Keg has information on genes, on proteins, path, metabolic pathways, um, and uh, uh, molecular interactions. And it's, uh, it, it, it tri focuses on multiple organisms. It has vertebrates. It has reactions in, um, in invertebrates. It has a very, very large section on, on prokaryotic uh, pathways. Um, and it organizes all, all, these, uh, all these pathways into a, series, into a series of diagrams. Here's a typical keg pathway diagram. How many people have not seen keg? One, oh, a couple of people. Okay. Well, it's, I, I recommend it. It's a great thing. So here is, uh, here is their depiction of the cell cycle. Uh, you probably can't read, it, read any of it here, but each of these uh, green boxes is a, uh, is a gene. When you have two boxes together, it's a complex, a complex between two, sorry, not genes, but two uh, proteins. Uh, and the, uh, the arrows indicate the, uh, the, the reactions here. They're using little, they use little circles to indicate, uh, to indicate uh, the reaction centers. Reactome is newer. And it's distinguished from uh, Keg by its uh, very sharp focus on human biology. So it typically has uh, a lot of detail on human and less information on other model systems. Um, in contrast to Keg, which is uh, for which you have to you have to pay a licensing fee to download it, uh, Reactome is completely open source and open access. Uh, focuses, as I said, on human pathways. Uh, it has metabolism, a lot of uh, intermediary metabolism, a lot of signaling pathways, and many other biological processes, including uh, many uh, developmental uh, processes. Every pathway is uh, traced by curators to the primary literature, uh, and it cross-references to other uh, databases, including CAKE, and provides uh, data analysis and visualization tools, some of which we'll be looking at. Here is, you've, you've all had a module on, um, on uh, gene set enrichment yesterday, right? Okay. So gene set enrichment is one of the core pathway network analysis techniques that everybody agrees, is, agrees works and is a good thing to do. And so uh, Reactome, as well as Keg, offer an interactive uh, pathway in, in, enrichment tool. Um, this is looking at what happens when you upload the 127 TCGA uh, pan-cancer driver genes uh, into, uh, into uh, the reactome enrichment mapper, um, and uh, you get a, uh, 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 and it shows you which, uh, which pathways are enriched. So there are three panels here that I'll point out. You'll be seeing this in more detail during the exercise. Um, the left side here is an event, is what's called the event hierarchy. It's kind of a top-down table of contents of all pathways. It opens up to show the enriched reactions, and we have uh, a bunch of signal transduction pathways, signaling by EGFR, by FGF, by insulin receptor, by NGF, all of which were statistically uh, significantly enriched in that set. Uh, ERB2 is particularly enriched here, and here I've opened it up to show some of the subpathways and reactions which are, uh, are, uh, 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 which are enriched. Uh, here is the pathway map, which is a little scrolling and zooming panel that you can, uh, you can expand and, uh, uh, and uh, pan through. And it's showing a graphical representation of what's here with the green indicating uh, significantly enriched uh, um, uh, complexes which contain the genes which are which contain the genes which are mutated. And so you can zoom out here to get a kind of a, an overall bird's eye look at what's enriched, 
or you can zoom in to see uh, specifically where those mutations are and how they interact with other mutated genes. And then down here is uh, the uh, typically uh, significance value sorted, the p-value sorted list of enriched, of, of enriched pathways. And everything is linked together as you click on these enriched pathways. They'll be highlighted here and they'll appear. They'll be highlighted in the hierarchy browser as well. All right, questions? Yeah, we'll move on. So, what's the different? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, when you show, when you say there's that box and photos on the screen, those are the enriched ones. The rest is the whole pathway. Yeah. No. Well, so, what actually in this case, the the entire pathway is enriched. Okay. So it's a statistically significantly enriched pathway. Um, but um, the question is, where are the mutated genes which contributed to the enrichment? Okay. So um, most of these genes, don't, are, are, or most, most of the protein products of these genes, aren't floating around in the cell by themselves. They're involved in complexes. So what the green here is showing is the, um, the proportion of that complex that contains a gene that is mutated. And we can, you can you know, click on this and zoom in and see which, exactly which genes were mutated from your original list. Okay, so that gives you a that gives you a sense of how um, the the mutations contribute to the enrichment of the pathway. Okay. So one of the vulnerabilities, or one of the the, the problems of pathway um, databases, is that um, the there um, is that different curators will choose to represent pathways differently. It'll emphasize different things. And so if you start digging into, uh, into uh, Reactome and Keg and you look at something that they, a pathway that they have both curated extensively, such as uh, intr the intrinsic um, uh, uh, apoptosis pathway, here's a little bit of how re uh, Reactome represents uh, the um, uh, activation of caspase 8. And here is how Keg represents it. And uh, in this case, Keg has broken out all the members of the caspase family, whereas Reactome has grouped, has grouped them, grouped the ones that are equivalent. And the, you end up with pathways that look quite different from each other. And you could go slightly crazy trying to represent results that you get in Reactome from results you get in Keg. I think they're both legitimate ways of doing it, but they reflect value judgments, and it is it is confusing. Fortunately, um, and there are there are, are other databases such as uh, the uh, uh, the uh, NCIPD or uh, uh, the Panther database that have also done the, the similar pa the the cast space pathway, and they have different diagrams as well. Uh, fortunately, there's this very nice effort run out of Memorial Sloan Kettering called the Pathway Commons, in which um, uh, about a dozen pathway databases have agreed to export their data using a common representation um, uh, and uh, submit them to the Pathway Commons, where they are they are merged and integrated, and you can get a single con you can get uh, consensus views of those pathways using a uniform representation uh, through Pathway Commons. You can also download the pathways and use them as a basis for, for analysis. Okay, so I'm going to move now from <coughs> pathways to networks. Yes? Pathway Commons has not been updated since 2011, is that correct? No, it's, been, it's, it's currently being updated. It was updated it's back in right January. Page. We're for number two, there yeah. is actually a second site it was updated so back in ago, February. Very yeah. Thank you. Okay. I, I actually hadn't realized that they'd um, that, that the old site was still accessible. They should just it redirect. Like oh really? Okay. Yeah. So does it mean that one should use 
So my, you know, it, I think it, I, um, it depends on whether you want a, uh, a, a, you know, single st single style of doing it. Uh, so a, a single standard, if you want a single standard of curation, with the ad advantages that you'll get, you know, uniform decisions across each pathway of how to represent them. Um, then Reactome is, I would strongly recommend either Reactome or Keg. Um, if, however, you're, you're, you're concerned about coverage and you want to maximize your chances of getting a, getting a, uh, getting a hit in a pathway, which may not have been curated by Reactome, but was curated by Keg or vice versa, um, then the, the tools that Pathway Commons offers for gene set enrichment and for uh, and for visualization, um, I've, um, are um, uh, you know uh, is is the better is the better to way, better way to go, uh, or if you're hedging your bets, you do both. You do both, which is what most people would do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it uh, does not. It does not directly contain data from Keg. It contains data that was independently curated from the literature. Pathway Commons contains information from uh, from Keg, from Reactome, and from ten other ten other Pathway databases. Okay. So now we're going to switch from talking about Pathway databases to talking about uh, network databases. And I'm going to give you just a in quick intro on interaction networks, which should be familiar to you from yesterday. I'll just go through this quite quickly. So a uh, interaction network is a uh, very simple and uh, straightforward data model in which there are just two, uh, uh, two components. There are nodes, which are genes or proteins or lipids or uh, RNAs. And there are edges which connect them. And an edge means that there's a relationship between them. And what that relationship is depends very much on what that network database was set up to describe. And the edges can be, um, can be directed. They can have an arrowhead or a, um, uh, or a, a line uh, indicating a directionality of the interaction, usually activation or inhibition. Uh, they can be. Uh, they can be weighted. They can be heavier edges to to indicate a greater, a stronger relationship, um, or they can be just a very simple, undirected, unweighted edges. Uh, I've already said this, um, and edges really can be any sort. It can be any sort of relationship. I'll show you a few examples of different types of interaction networks. Um, Here is this is an example of a. Uh, uh, a human transcriptional regulatory network from the ENCODE project where each of the uh, nodes is a gene and the edges indicate a positive or negative regulatory relationship between them. So these are, these are transcription fat, uh, sorry, the inner circle here is transcription factors and the outer circle are the genes that they regulate. Uh, or you can have a uh, network uh, indicating uh, interactions between uh, the proteins of an infective virus and the host. That's what we're showing here. You can have a metabolic network showing uh, the uh, showing uh, relationships between um, uh, uh, small molecules uh, uh, identified by HPLC. You can have a protein-protein interaction database. Uh, generated by proteomics or by yeast two hybrids. Uh, or you can have something, um, uh, something such as a disease network. In the disease network, the nodes are actually diseases, and they're connected to each other by, uh, 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 by a metric that indicates how many genes, altered genes they have in common, All right, which can be, actually be quite revealing. Okay, so when we're talking about network databases, you have to talk about specifically what network database you uh, uh, what the network database was was designed to to show, 
and to decide which network database or which set of network databases are appropriate for the questions you're asking. So network bases, databases can be built automatically from high throughput omics data or uh, in the same way the pathway databases are built using curation from the primary literature. Um, by and large, uh, network databases have more extensive coverage of biological systems. So Reactome, which is one of the, the largest human-oriented databases, probably it is the largest, uh, uh, that's uh, open access, is, um, covers uh, about, what is it, about 9,000, 8,000 something genes at the current time? Robin? Yeah, okay. I should know the exact number. Um, but a, that's, that's still less than half of the uh, human genome, whereas a typical network database will be in the 15,000 to 20,000 15, to 20,000 genes. It'll have greater coverage. Um, in most network databases, the uh, evidence is, uh, is uh, more tentative than in a pathway database. Typically, uh, it captures information about things which are, are related because they're, say, co-expressed in microarrays. But you don't exactly know what the cause of that relationship is, what the mechanism is. And there are quite a few good curated uh, network databases. There's BioGrid, there's Intact, and there's Mint. Each one has um, uh, uh, roughly uh, uh, several, has several hundred thousand interactions, typically um, uh, in the order of, uh, 20, of uh, 15 to 30,000 uh, um, uh, uh, genes or proteins, uh, and uh, they have different they. they uh, have different standards for their curation, but there are uh, well, their curation process is well described. A couple example here from Intact. Uh, uh, it, the, because of the simple data model, you can ask simple, straightforward questions such as what interacts with p53 or with tp53, and in this case, it found 9,058 proteins that are, are described in the literature as as interacting with. P53, and then you have to use your judgment on how many of those relationships are, um, yeah, do you trust? Can you still keep the type of information? Uh, yes, you can actually, you actually can. You can uh, filter it by the source, uh, the, whether it was from the literature or whether it was um, a high throughput experiment that was taken out of a table. Uh, you can filter, in, in some cases, by uh, the, the weight of the evidence. Okay. P53 is, a, is an outlier because it's been so heavily studied and it seems to interact with almost anything. Okay, I'm going to skip this one because it's not actually contributing to the, to the flow of the talk much. And then talk about, so that's, so that's what a network database is. Any questions before we go into analysis? Okay, so pathway databases curated, very rich text, very rich descriptions of mechanics but typically lower coverage of the genome. Network databases, shallower, simpler data model, easy to com easier to compute over, as you'll see. Um, high coverage, but, it's, but very shallow. You have a question, sir? Reactome is on which hub? Hmm? Reactome. Reactome. It, it's a pathway database. Not in yeah, so the, of the ones I've talked about, Reactome and Keg are pathway databases, um, and Intact, Mint, and BioGrid are network databases. Now, each now there is, it's a little less clean cut than I've described because, in fact, many of the pathway databases also have a section on ne on network interactions, and and uh, Reactome, in fact. Takes, inter takes interactions from the intact database and brings them in and puts them up as a extra layer of information to try to give you the best of both worlds. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what the, in, in, the pathway, in the pathway network, you would know that P53 is binding to its inhibitor. Yeah. In intact? In intact, you'll just get a big list of 9,000... <coughs> interactions of various sorts and you wouldn't necessarily know what the order in which 
uh, order of events is, or which way it's leading, or what what they're doing. So, in Reactum, you put p fifty three, and you get you'll get a yeah with, with Reactum, you put in p fifty three. Well, you'll probably um, you'll you'll get you'll get a uh, a handful of pathways in which p fifty three is a partic participates, and you'll get a picture. You'll get a a, a browsable mm -hmm. diagram. Of um, of p53 in context with its pathway, and you also get a text description that a curator or a um, or or a um, an, an an outside author contributed to it. A little mini review describing the role of p53 in apoptosis or cells uh, or uh, cell cycle checkpoints or whatever you're looking at. Right, so you know that this pathway checkpoint. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can actually you can actually do things with Reactome like generating a PDF, which then gives you a little it will give you a, a actually somewhat large um, document that you can read through like a review. So not. Not pleasant reading, I have to say, because it's generated by machine, but it's got mm -hmm. all the information there. Yeah. Just like yesterday, when we did the read compiler, we, we compare against the pathway database, yeah. tag or reactor. Mm -hmm. Like, is it so good if we compare against the network database? Or, I mean, like, you said it's broader, but it's better. Yeah. So, so pathway databases are only going to give you information about um, about pathways which are well described that are in the literature. Um, they will be several years behind the, the cutting edge because uh, typically curators like to look at at reviews and mini reviews to get the context, and they like to see experimental results replicated before it goes into the database. Um, if it, so, uh, a pathway database won't tell you anything about new bio. Well, won't won't tell you much about new biology that hasn't been that hasn't been studied. Whereas an interaction database could bring in, uh, you know, proteins that are are poorly studied, are just annotated, just annotated proteins. They have really no information. And one of the, one or more of those might be might, might be something something really important. But like, as I remember yeah. correctly, like the profile, they don't have the option to compare against the network database. Is it like? Uh, yeah, you'll have to you'll have to ask Yuri if and when he comes back. I, I don't I don't know. Like maybe there's some other tools, but I mean, yeah. there should be some tools that can also compare against. Oh, okay. Yes, I know. I know what you're talking about now. Yuri talked about um, looking using G Profiler to to look at old old pathway databases like like the like the ones in David. What act what he was actually doing is not looking at the databases databases so much as the um, uh, the, the the analysis tools because what analysis tools typically do is in 2010, for example, David went, the people who wrote David, went and they took the pathway information out of KEG and Reactome as they were at that time, um, put them into the special searchable format that they use to do the analysis, um, and then opened it up to the world. So everybody who uses the David tool uses the 2010 version of Reactome. And since then, Reactome has added 2,000 um, uh, new genes, and so it's out of date. And so, the in in Yuri's Yuri, the, the paper that Yuri talked about ye uh, yesterday, um, he was using as an ex uh, uh, he wasn't ex he wasn't limiting it to pathway databases. It was both pathway and network databases that that he, he examined. But he didn't do a comprehensive look at all of them because there are, if you conclude all the major and minor pathway network databases, there are easily several hundred of them. And they're always being updated. But the, uh, the point of that, that paper was to show that you should, be, you, be care you should look 
at the currency date of the tool that you're using and make sure it's, it's been updated recently. OK, now I'm going to move on. I'm going to talk about the, the, what you do. Once you have the information, the path layer network information, what do you do with it? And so this is from a, um, uh, uh, a uh, nature perspe uh, methods perspectives that uh, I worked on with a group of people about a year ago. Um, and uh, the reference to it is at the end of, end of the handout. Um, but what we, what, after surveying the literature, what we did is we divided the types of analysis that one performs into three different categories. One is a gene set, gene set enrichment, which you've heard about. And, and typical tools of GSEA and G profiler that you heard about, GoMiner that you've probably heard about, and the various embedded um, enrichment tools. For so, so example, the Leactome colorizer that I showed you, Keg has a similar colorizer. And each what these do is they take they take something that is very connected. You know, the, net, the, the interaction network for the human cell is almost every single gene is connected to, uh, to, other, to another gene. And you kind of arbitrarily slice it into a series of gene sets. If you're using a pathway database, it's usually pretty easy because you take whatever the division is that the curators say. I have signaling pathways, I have NGF signaling, I have EGFR signaling. Even though, in fact, they interact, those, those pathways all interact a lot, um, they, get, they get broken into discrete sets. And then, you, uh, then once you have the, your bags, you do a gene set enrichment and you look for statistically overrepresented uh, cluster uh, representation of your experimental gene set in those bags. Okay, and it gives you a series of enriched networks or depleted networks from, from the gene set you're looking at. And this is what this is this is kind of the standard practice. Everybody does this. Uh, the second and, and, and more sophisticated uh, way of doing this is uh, we're calling a de novo subnetwork um, disco uh, discovery and, and clustering, or construction and clustering. And so here you take the pathway or the network. It's typically done on networks. Um, uh, and you do not arbitrarily cut it into bags, but instead you project the list of, of genes that you have, the list of the microarray of, uh, list of genes that are upregulated, or the, the long tail of rare cancer mutations. You project them onto the network and you see where they see where they are, and you look for topologically unlikely groupings in the network. Is everyone following me? So you're looking for clusters of altered genes which are uh, closer together in the network than you would predict by chance. And this is discovering, in theory, um, uh, biologically significant relationships among those altered genes which are telling you about how they interact with each other to generate, generate the, biology, the, the biological disease or other process that you're looking for. Yes, sir? Oh, no, no, I'm stretching. What? Oh, you're just stretching. Just stretching so. Okay, I've been in train to, to, to look for you. Yes? So in this, do you use any, it's a de novo, so do you use any background part of network on which you try to project the genes, or you don't take anything in the background? Yeah, well, that is the, the devil is the devil is in the details. What do you use? What do you use as the background? So, um, so each of the techniques has different uh, different ways of doing this. Uh, I'm just going to name a few: string, gene mania, hotnet, uh, gene go. Uh, there's a uh, an R. Uh, there's a functional interaction plugin for Reactome uh, called Reactome Fi Viz that will, that Robin will be showing you. Um, and uh, many of them do. Many of them require you to choose a background. So if you're comparing, uh, you know, cancer driver genes, you might choose all genes or all all assay genes as your background. Um, if you are, uh, uh, if you're looking at the distribution of of copy number variants in a 
in a cohort of, of patients with a men, with a mental illness. You might choose um, the uh, the CNVs in the patients with mental illness against their SIBs who don't have it. Um, in um, in some of the, some of the techniques, such as the gene mania, does, that doesn't doesn't give you the option of providing a background, and it just assumes dis the, uh, uniform distribution across the across the genes. Okay. It uh, and you know if I actually listed all the all the tools here, there, there are uh, there are probably about a hundred hundred tools that all try to do this do similar things. Yeah. Whether they cluster together or not. Yes, topologically, uh, in the reaction in the reaction map. So if if I choose if I choose a random set of genes, project them onto the network, and just sort of think of it visually, I've got a big hairball, and I'm highlighting those genes. Um, under the the null hypothesis is that they are going to be kind of scattered at random throughout the hairball. And the uh, uh, the um, non-null hypothesis is that they're going to be they're going to be clustered in some way. So if it's if I'm looking at a biological process that involves uh, overactivation of uh, signaling path of cell signaling pathways, then I'll get a cl large cluster in the portion of the network where the various uh, uh, GPCR receptors are, for example. This, this thing is different from the first one is that in first one you take individual networks separately. First one I decided in advance where I'm going to draw the lines. Yes. Between. Here you take the whole global Here you view take the whole view. And put everything onto it. And you and let the data tell you whether it's randomly distributed or not. And if it's not randomly distributed, you extract clusters which um, you, you make the claim are functionally related to each other and are related to the, the disease you're studying. Okay, yeah. Uh, now you have a question. Um, should, should they, one and two give you the same answer? Should, should whatever you get in two be mapped onto the gene ontology? Well, they uh, uh, they are they will give you not a, they will give you non-identical results. Hopefully, they will give you consistent results with each other. But if you, cons if you consider that in, uh, um, in, gene, in gene set enrichment analysis, I may, I, I may arbitrarily have taken, or the curators may arbitrarily have taken a, um, you know, uh, a pathway which, um, you know, span, uh, a, 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 taken a pathway which is related to the disease, and just because of history, they've they've split it in two, and they said, well, this one has to do with uh, EGF signaling, and this is like the this is the KRAS pathway, the RAS pathway. And we've called it diff They're they're actually two parts of the same thing, but we've we've split them just because of history, the way it was studied. Um, it's possible that the gene set um, um, the the gene set enrichment analysis, because you split that pathway in two halves, won't achieve statistical significance in either half. Okay, Or that it's going to give you a, a, a bunch of pathways, which are all statistically enriched, which are all enriched, um, but because of the, because the, of the, the historical way the, they, they were given names, um, you don't actually see that, oh yeah, these actually do belong together. And that's why you end up with these things like the um, like concept maps, which did Gary talk about the concept maps yesterday? It's, it's a technique that, his, that he and his lab developed to take gene set enrichment um, uh, data and put them back together again uh, based on sharing, based on sharing of, of genes. And it's trying to correct in a post hoc way the splitting that you get when you're doing a gene ontology-based enrichment uh, enrichment test. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So does it mean that you can use reaction both in line one and two? 
Yep, absolutely. Actually, so Reactome att attempts to provide all three. And uh, the I'm not going to. Sh I, I showed you that one screenshot from one, which is just the the um, the, the colorization of the map. Uh, two is a uh, two and three. Robin is going to show you. It's in a tool called uh, Reactome FI Viz. Yes. Um, that is that is often the way often the, the uh, for gene set enrichment. Um, the, uh, depending on the tool, um, but they will um, they will often uh, put genes into a single pathway and not allow them to be to appear in multiple pathways. If you allow them to be in multiple pathways, then you have to do a cor then you have to do corrections. Some of the more sophisticated ones, such as GoMiner, allows you to have the same gene in multiple Go pathways, and it tem it, and it, it it corrects for uh, double counting. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's so what the output from uh, de novo uh, clustering is going to be a series of of subnetworks w in which. Uh, the algorithm has discovered a statistically unlikely clustering of the genes of interest. So it'll give you a little subnetwork here. It may give you several others. And you then have to go and figure out what the, what the significance of those, of those networks are. And oddly enough, people frequently t turn to uh, gene set enrichment tools to do that. They'll take this whole subnetwork. Which includes both the red genes, which are were in your query, and some white ones, which are not in your data set, but highly interacting with the ones that you search. They'll take this whole thing and put that into a gene set enrichment analysis to find out what this subnetwork does. Do you follow? Okay. And so the advantage of this is it may allow you to discover novel bio novel biology, which you would not get. From uh, the from fixed predetermined sets, and then the next step is well, I've got this, I've got this little uh, um, in, in rich subnetwork, but what exactly what exactly does that mean for the cell? Is it is it uh, you know uh, drive uh, is it uh, driving the cell towards apoptosis? Is it uh, driving it towards increased mitosis? Uh, and that's where the third um, uh, category comes in. This is pathway-based modeling. Essentially, you're building a computational model of what happens when you increase the activity of, of three genes in a network and decrease the activity of a fourth. What is the integrated effect of doing that, given the regulatory relationships among them? So it takes a series of mutations or other alterations. Uh, puts it on the computational model and tells you and makes a prediction about what the cell will do. It'll grow faster or it'll die faster. Um, and uh, again, there are lots of, uh, lots of tools here. I'm going to talk about one called Paradigm. But the output of each, in each case is um, a set of gene, uh, of gene activities after you've integrated all the variations. And in theory, this gives you the most explanatory power because it can allow you to do what-if questions. You can do things uh, in principle like, well, if I've, got, if I've got these two mutations in a cancer pathway, what happens if I add a drug to that pathway that'll knock out a third gene? Will it, can, I, can I use this to restore the pathway activity to the normal level, or can I use it to actually completely abolish the pathway activity and kill the, and kill the cell? Okay. So, yes? Yeah, I'm sorry, and I'm sorry. The, yeah, it, it's a little hard for me to read it too, but it says, um, you're, you're asking what does it say on three here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it says, Evaluation of potential network rules. Oh, it says pathway-based modeling. Yeah. Okay. 
So, uh, so the, here's a summary of this. So, for um, in, enrichment of uh, uh, enrichment of fixed gene sets, the basic question you can ask is what biological processes are altered in this uh, cell. I said cancer here because it was a review of cancer-based methods. Uh, for number two is are there new pathways altered in the uh, in this system, and are there clinically relevant uh, uh, tumor subtypes? Again, cancer focused. And then the third is how are the net, how are the pathway activities altered in a particular patient who has multiple uh, alterations? Are there perhaps targetable pathways that can be used to uh, kill the altered cell or to uh, restore it to a, a normal phenotype? Yeah. So if you have a targeted panel yes. for, say, a genes or for panel, yeah. then ideally I should go with the second method first, identify the red dots, and get the white ones here, yeah. and then go for the first step to get the enrichment. That, make, that, that, would, that would be a reasonable strategy. Okay, I'm going to move on. I don't want to eat too much time, too. I'm kind of starting to run out of time here. So... Um, so for pathway-based analysis, there are some there are many problems in using uh, pathway databases as is to do to do biological analysis. One is that the pathways are typically uh, organized hierarchically, and those hierarchical pathways are arbitrary, and um, and that will give large pathways greater weight in many analyses than small pathways, but, but worse is just the arbitrariness. And so um, one approach that people typically take is to take those beautifully curated hierarchies and just flatten them down into a system-wide network. Um, and then we have the problem that we talked about before, where there are um, that the, the boundaries that have been driven, that have been uh, uh, drawn between uh, curated pathways, um, uh, you know, arbitrarily can break a single pathway into two smaller ones just for historical reasons, uh, and you end up with this problem of um, genes and proteins which are contributing to multiple pathways are only listed once, uh, and um, there are uh, so what one again what 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 people do is to flatten the pathway down into a network and then to use the relationships to show the crosstalk between them. Uh, other issues in pathway data analysis, pathway-based data analysis is that uh, typically uh, you don't have just one type, if you're doing patient-based analysis, typically you don't have just have one type of omics data, you have multiple types. You have copy numbers, you have gene expressions, you have epigenetic data, somatic mutations, uh, and uh, you need to figure out how to model all those changes at the same time. And I'm going to skip skip that. Okay. I'm going to skip, I'm just going to, I'm going to skip through things here a little bit here just to catch up. Um, Okay, so de novo subnetwork. So for de novo, de novo subnetwork construction and clustering, this is type two. Um, it's uh, just is just a review of what I said before. You take your list of altered genes, proteins, RNAs, and you find topologically unlikely configurations, genes that are closer to each other on the network than you would expect by chance, uh, either using a um, you know, a random distribution or a back or a background of your choice. You then extract clusters, the unlikely configurations, and you annotate them. Usually, annotate them with Go. Um, to do network clustering, you use the same techniques that are have been used in analysis of the World Wide Web, or LinkedIn, or Facebook, to identify communities of people who are actor interacting with each other. More frequently than you would expect, you would expect by chance. So exactly the same algorithms used for social networking are used here, um, and uh, the uh, uh, there are a suite uh, a suite of techniques, some of which are more accurate but slower, others of which uh, 
balance it the other way around. Here are, the, here are a few of the network clustering algorithms that are used. Gervin Newman method, Markov clustering. Uh, so Gervin Ger, Newman is, is uh, the, so for a long time, the gold standard, highly accurate but slow. Markov clustering is, um, is less accurate, more stochastic, but it's a lot faster and it's scalable to very large sets. Then there's a method written by uh, uh, Ben Raphael, Brown University, called HotNet, which models networks as a metallic lattice and then heats up one of the um, uh, heats up nodes, which are, are altered, and then it traces out where the uh, where the heat goes. And this is actually uh, good because it avoids a problem with, uh, P with genes like p53, which are highly uh, highly annotated, have lots and lots and lots of, uh, of edges leading out, them, out of them, it actually downweights P53 because it has so many connections. Um, there's a method called uh, hypermodules, which is in a Cytoscape app, which, is de which um, was designed to find clusters that correlated with clinical characteristics and patient sets. And then there's the, the Reactome FI network, which gives you uh, gives you actually multiple clustering methods and gives you some uh, of the uh, type 3 computational modeling techniques as well. Okay, so here's what a, a typical network clustering algorithm will give you. Um, this, is just a, this is just a cartoon, but it's showing that there was a, a much larger network uh, and, uh, from, uh, and from that large network Six different clusters were extracted, some that are small, some that are large. Uh, the, each network is more highly interconnected within itself than between, but you can still see that there's a lot of crosstalk uh, uh, with, within them. Okay, and then your challenge then is, to fi is figuring out what each of these clusters means. Uh, in the case of the reactum, uh, 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 FI Viz app, app which uh, uh, Robin will show you. Um, it uh, 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 you start you, it gives you displays like this one, where we have a uh, uh, a, a network cluster in which the uh, uh, in which the uh, size of the nodes indicates the the frequency with which a gene is altered or mutated. Uh, and it allows you to draw pictures, annotate it, uh, and uh, uh, dig in to understand the details. And it can do, do things, it, it can help you uh, generate uh, uh, hypotheses on how genes uh, are uh, related to the disease phenotype. Uh, and it also, uh, also allows you to look at individual patients and see how they differ in terms of which network modules are affected. Okay. So um, the, uh, in, order to, in order to take um, uh, a pathway database like Reactome and to allow you to do computational modeling on it, you have to, flat, you have to flatten out the, uh, uh, the data model in the way I describe uh, in the way I described earlier. And so uh, essentially what one does is you take this, uh, take a reaction, which has inputs, outputs, activators, inhibitors, catalysts, and so forth, and you turn it into a series of functional interactions. So for example, one functional interaction here will be that input one and input two interact with each other. They have to do that in order to, to participate in a reaction. The catalyst and input one interacts. The catalyst and input two interacts. The activator in, uh, interacts with input one and input two. And all the outputs interact with each other in the context of a, of a, uh, of a uh, cat, uh, context of a complex. Uh, and um, by, by doing this, you've taken the, the, um, uh, you've, you've taken the pathway and you've flattened it out into a large number of interactions 
which can then go into um, the uh, into these modeling tools. Also, once you have flattened a pathway database out into this type of thing, you can now add these two hybrid data information from BioGrid and Intact and bring other interactions in which weren't originally curated. Uh, you have to be careful when you do this because you can easily create a, 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 a mess of a lot of false positive interactions. Uh, when we uh, did this for Reactome, and this is the work of Guanming Lu, who um, was originally a postdoc in my lab and now runs a, uh, his own lab at OHSU as a, um, uh, as a faculty member. Um, uh, what, in, in order to construct the, uh, 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 the functional interaction network well, uh, you need to use, uh, uh, Guanming used machine learning to, uh, in order to sort out high confidence interactions from low confidence interactions to create a, a high quality functional interaction network, which has uh, about 300,000 interactions and 12,000 uh, gene products in, involved. Um, this is uh, growing slowly. It's probably be about 13,000 by the end of the year. Uh, and this network, is, uh, this network was tuned to have, um, uh, to have very few false positives. So it's not as large as some other um, networks. But this is the basis for um, the pathway analysis tools that Robin will show you. Uh, what does yeah. PPI mean? Oh, protein-protein interaction. I'm sorry, I'm skipping over this so that we don't run into the coffee break. Uh, this is what uh, just a little bit of that functional interaction network looks like. This is a 5% of a much larger hairball. And you, you see that, that the nodes are not randomly distributed. They are all, there's all an intrinsic clustering. A lot of this is complexes physical complexes. Okay, and then we're just, here I'm just, uh, yeah, this is a little animation. I forgot that this was here. Uh, a little animation showing how you can project altered uh, gene products, genes and gene products onto this, do uh, 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 find unlikely uh, clusters, bring in um, uh, interact, in interacting, uh, bring in linkers, that tie them together, and then that gets turned into uh, a series of subnetworks that are connected to each other. Okay. So what happens when you apply this to 127 cancer driver genes from pan can from pan cancer? You end up with actually a much smaller set of interconnected uh, interconnected uh, uh, subnetworks, and they they all make a lot of sense. So here's a signaling subnetwork, here's a cell cycle subnetwork, here's a p53 subnetwork, and here is uh, the uh, uh, non-GPCR um, sig uh, signaling, uh, uh, signaling pathways. And you can further break these up into sub-subnetworks and, and study those. But uh, it gives you a, what's, what's a very sensible picture if you look at, um, at other disease processes, infectious disease or mental disease, you get a quite different set of modules. Okay. Sometimes you can use this directly for translational results. So for example, uh, this is again work that Quan Ming did a couple of years ago. Um, uh, if you uh, take this and look just at frequently mutated genes in e estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, um, you end up with a, with a series of modules. You end up with a series of 13 modules, uh, similar to the ones that I showed you for pan cancer. Um, but it, there's this one, which involves the cell cycle M phase and Aurora B kinase signaling, um, which is highly variant at the RNA level from one ER positive breast cancer patient to another. And it turns out that if you have uh, low levels of expression, in this uh, cell cycle and Aurora B kinase uh, uh, submodule, um, those patients have a much better prognosis than those who have high expression. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve showing percent of patient proportion of patients surviving at 0, 50, 120 uh, months time going forward here, and this is actually such a strong prognostic factor 
that patients who have high expression in this sub, uh, subnetwork uh, have um, um, as bad a prognosis as patients who are triple negative, who are estrogen receptor minus. So we'd be able, we're able to find a subpopulation of patients based just on expression levels of genes in this newly discovered um, uh, network, um, which uh, 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 gives, gives patients uh, just as, uh, as bad a prognosis, it finds a uh, subset of patients uh, who have an, an exceptionally poor prognosis who otherwise would have been uh, uh, um, thought to have a, uh, a good prognosis, and they might, have, might, they might be candidates for more aggressive uh, therapy. So that's an example of discovering new biology just from doing very, very simple uh, type of analysis. I'm going to end on pathway-based uh, modeling. So in, in pathway-based modeling, uh, uh, you don't you you uh, um, you actually preserve the functional relationships between the genes in the in the in the network so that you preserve the positive and negative regulatory, uh, um, uh, regulatory relationships, and also you preserve the identity of, um, what the, of, of what the nodes are. RNAs are treated differently from genes, are treated differently from protein products. Okay? So you preserve the biological relationships, you create a computational model of this, and then this allows you to take multiple molecular alterations affecting different types of macromolecules um, and transform them into predicted altered pathway activities. And it's, this is really where pathway modeling becomes systems biology. So there are various way, approaches for this. The oldest approach is to use partial differential equations or Boolean models. These are techniques that have been developed really for understanding metabolism and applied successfully to modeling fermentation in, in yeast and prokaryotes. Um, mostly suitable for biochemical systems and they become increasingly intractable as a number of, 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 um, uh, of macromolecules or nodes in your network uh, exceed about 10. Okay, so they're very good for very small systems. Then there are network flow models, such as NetForest and NetworkIn, network in, which uh, were designed for uh, signaling cascades, typically kinase cascades, and work well in that limited field. There are transcriptional regulatory network-based reconstruction methods, such as arachne, which are designed specifically for transcription factors and their targets. Uh, and then finally, there's a more general sense, a general set of tools based on uh, probabilistic graph models or PGMs, um, which can be, which scale well to very large networks and can be used for um, uh, uh, for um, biological processes, which are um, uh, for more general biological processes. It can be used for transcriptional analysis, or they can be used for kinase cascades, or they can be used for uh, other, types, other types of regulation. So the way, PGM, the, way the PGMs work is, um, and there should be a picture here, but I think there isn't, um, is uh, you develop a, a, a network model in which, uh, in which there are directed weighted, uh, uh, weighted arrows indicating inhibitory or, um, uh, or activating relationships. Each of the arrows has a weight associated with it, which uh, attempts to model if you, uh, what happens if you double the, uh, react, um, the, concentra the activity of gene A, what does it do to the activity of gene B? And it can be set to uh, a 1, in which case it'll be doubling will double it or it can be set to negative one, which doubling will decrease it by half, or it can be set to anything in between. Okay? And then the modeling system propagates those changes using uh, 
technique used typically using um, uh, Bayesian uh, reasoning to propagate the changes from the top of the network down to the down to the bottom. And if there are cycles, there are often regular inhibit in, there are often regulatory cycles. It attempts to account for the loops as well to to give a prediction of what the integrated activity changes are. And uh, the nice thing about this is that you can apply different types of uh, omics data to these models. You can apply uh, copy number variations to it under the hypothesis that that deleting a gene will uh, uh, will uh, will uh, reduce its activity to zero, or amplifying it a hundredfold will increase its activity. You can apply it to mRNAs. You can apply it to mutations and proteins. You have to be very careful, though, to model mutations correctly. So, for example, if a mutation is an activating mutation, it's got to be modeled as, as, as activating the, uh, uh, the gene. If it's a loss of function, it's got to be modeled as a loss of function. Often you don't know, and so that's one of the limitations of this type of analysis. You can identify significantly impacted uh, disease pathways, and you can link those activities to patient phenotypes. So this is an example of, of Paradigm, which is the first widely used uh, of these PGM tools. Um, Paradigm takes a set of, uh, of uh, biological of, uh, of pathways. In this case, it's a very simplified version of apoptosis pathway, where MDM2 is inhibiting p53. Okay, and then it expands this um, to account for uh, what the genes, RNAs, and proteins are doing. So here we're showing that the MDM2 gene uh, makes the MDM2 RNA, makes the MDM2 protein, which then makes the MDM2 active protein. Same thing is happening here in p53. The gene is making the RNA, it's making the protein. Uh, and, then there's, and then there's a coming together here where the active MDM2 protein and the p53 protein um, contribute to a, uh, uh, you know, contribute weights to uh, the p53 active protein, which if activated leads to apoptosis. And so each of these is associated with a direction and a weight. Some of these weights can be positive or, or negative. Typically they're, they're positive here. And this is a negative one. W7 is negative. Uh, and now you can put mutations on top. I think that's coming up in the end. Yes. Yay. I remembered it. Uh, we can say, well, what happens if we mutate the MDM2 gene? What happens if we have a uh, copy number deletion of p53? What happens if our microRNA, uh, or sorry, if our uh, microarray or an RNA seq shows a big change in the levels of MDM2 RNA? What happens if mass spec shows that p53 is not folding correctly and is being degraded? And so those can go all you can put all those in on a patient by patient basis, um, and uh, and ask what happens to the downstream phenotype that we care about. In this, surprisingly enough, seems to work pretty well. So this is a, uh, a figure from the first Paradigm article published in 2010. Uh, Paradigm is, is uh, a, from a collaboration between David Hausler and Joshua Stewart at UCSC. Um, and they're looking at glioblastoma multiforme from the TCGA project. They uh, took a series of um, uh, about, a, uh, about 100 different pathways and they modeled the uh, activity changes in each of those patients. And they found that different patients have different reproducible alterations in, uh, in the activities of some pathways, GATA pathway, E2F, EGFR pathway. And those distinguish different clusters of patients um, that, uh, that uh, if you were looking at it, the level of individual genes, there wouldn't be clear clusters, but when you look at the integrated uh, pathway activities, there are clear relationships between patients who are deficient in GATA uh, interleukin signaling, patients who have activation of EGFR, and so on. And then you can compare these four clusters of patients to see their clinical characteristics. And in fact, some of them have different, have different prognostic uh, some, some of them have more aggressive diseases than others. And there are 
uh, other distinguished, there's also, some of them are distinguished by different histopathology. Okay. Here's an example from, uh, 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 another example from uh, reactome FIVs uh, on an ovarian cancer patient network patient ne network. We're looking here at two different ovarian cancer patients from TCGA. We're looking at the pathway activities uh, around, uh, P, around the P53. In one case, this patient has very high P53 activity, low CREB, uh, uh, um, uh, CREB binding protein uh, activity. Another patient, another case, this patient has high CREB BP and low P53 activity. Uh, so it's distinguishing, even though they have similar mutation profiles, they're different at the activity pathway level. So there's good and bad news about paradigm. Um, the bad news is that, that uh, the paradigm itself um, is very difficult for people outside of UCSC to use um, because it was just, it's, uh, it, although it's open source, it's hard to get it to running and they don't, uh, they don't provide any pathway models. You have to make them yourselves. Documentation is scant and takes a long time to run. It requires a cluster to run. Um, we were very excited when we read the Paradigm uh, uh, paper, papers uh, a few years ago. So um, uh, Guanming Wu and uh, uh, others in my lab uh, took Paradigm and incorporated them into Reactome FIVs, and we, pre we published Reactome-based pathway models and have improved the performance, so you can now run it interactively. And Robin will show you how to do this. And then I'm just going to um, end with uh, 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 references and uh, links for you. Great. And happy to take questions, and then we go into a uh, coffee break. So the... the um, the next, the lab starts at 10.30, so maybe we could take a, a couple questions, and then people can go to coffee break, and I'll, I'll stay and answer your questions during the break, okay? Yes? So when you met with these patients through these networks who try to evaluate the effect, um, do you assume that they all have, they all are deleterious patients? No, and I think that and that is the... Uh, that is the, the challenge of doing the modeling correctly. So, it, it, of course, it, 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 um, uh, if you have, so it, and it depends on the context. So if you have a deletion of the gene, that's an easy, that's easy case, directly model that as loss of function. If you have a amplification, you actually don't know. It, um, the RNA levels um, um, often, but not always, increase as you increase the copy number. Sometimes you increase the copy number 100-fold and the RNA level doesn't change. So the most um, uh, are, so uh, RNA, is, uh, RNA levels are pretty good because the RNA level goes up, you can think the activity probably goes up, goes down, the activity goes down. Uh, mutations are very tricky. Um, many mutations are loss of function mutations. Um, but they have to be distinguished between from the uh, from activating mutations, uh, and they have to be distinguished from silent mutations, which aren't doing which aren't doing anything. And uh, that's a whole other that's a whole how to do that is a whole other kettle of fish. Mutation significance prediction. There are some tech, there are uh, various families of techniques for, for trying to make that make that guess, ranging from. Um, you know, very simple techniques, um, looking at clustering of the mutations. If all the mutations are always hitting the same residue um, in, in multiple patients, it's likely to be an activating mutation because there are relatively few sites that you can mutate and, and have a gain of function. Whereas if they're scattered all over the gene, it's likely to be uh, a loss of function because there are many places where you can do that, but it's not a, it's not a uh, hard and fast rule. More sophisticated techniques use 3D modeling to predict uh, what the effect on the active site is. Uh, or you can use genetics. And you can say, well, in cancer patients, um, this is a, 
I, I always see two hits here. It's recess this is a recessive mutation, because I have to have a deletion and a nonsense mutation. That's got to be loss of function. Whereas if I see a, a dominant pattern where the mutation affects uh, the mutation typically affects one one uh, uh, one copy of the gene, not the other. Then that's probably activating. That's using dominant recessive relationships, or you do them all and try to guess. I'm more interested in practically what you do. Do you have to decide ahead of time? Yes. And then just input whatever all the general facts. Yes. The mutation has. Yes. You have to, uh, if you want to model activity, you have to, you have to, um, you have to have a good guess at what the effect of the mutation is before you try to model it. Otherwise, it's going to be crap. Crap. Any other questions before we go to break? Okay, one more. So when we do the modeling, is it possible uh, if we have say large single patient, if we have twenty patients, we can tune the weights to get a desirable outcome? Oh, uh, no, I think the idea of tuning the, if you're saying tuning, tuning the weights in order to get the outcome that you want, no, that's not a, no, because a like, misunderstanding. Yeah. So, like, if you have a mutation in the gene, yeah. you don't know how much, how that mutation will affect the properties of the protein. Then you have an outcome from a patient or somebody, and then can relate it back to the mutation, and then so it's like the training phase of the model, sure. And the testing phase of the model. Sure, and and in fact, uh, in fact, if you have, uh, you know, it's 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 actually, if you have an experimental system, where you are systematically uh, introducing the mutation of interest by CRISPR or you are using shRNAs to up and down regulate the genes, then you can actually train the model, learn the weights, and now, um, and then have a much better, uh, have a, a, a much more predictive model than one that came out of, uh, out, of cura out of curation, which may not capture all the regulatory relationships. It is, can be quite difficult to generate the, the requisite data sets to, to train.